Hey everyone and welcome back to the News Agent podcast powered by Good Lord. My name is Andrea Warmington and I'm the senior content strategist here at Good Lord. This episode is a recording of our latest webinar, Hot Off the Press, with David Smith, a partner at JMW Solicitors, who covers all things right to rent, including upcoming legislation changes, which will allow letting agents and landlords to use identity service providers to digitally check the identity and eligibility of British and Irish citizens. He also covers the changes to right to rent checks for those with biometric residence permits. Just a reminder that this webinar is CPD accredited, so if you do want a copy of that certificate for your records, you can still register for the on-demand version of the webinar over at NewsAgent. You will find the link to this in your episode description, as well as loads of links to further reading on the topics that are covered in this episode. Uh, But for now, let's get into it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at our webinar today. And we are going to be talking about everything you need to know about right to rent. My name is Jolene. I am a referencing operations manager here at Good Lord. And I am joined today by David Smith, who is a solicitor at and partner at JMW Solicitors. So I'm just going to give you a quick brief on what we do here at Good Lord. So we do try to create kind of the best renting experience in the world. Um, we're on our way to definitely doing that. And um, here are some of the features that we do here. And this is kind of the best way to progress your letting deals remotely. So David is here with us today. I'm going to allow him to introduce himself. Morning, everyone. Um, I am, as, as has been said, a solicitor and partner at JNW Solicitors. And uh, I don't know, I, I know things about residential landlord and tenant law. There you go. That's, 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 that's my standard level of introduction. Thank you, David. So this is our agenda today. So we are going to be going over the new code of practice for right to rent. We're also going to be speaking about the COVID-19 adjustments. And we're also going to be going over IDSPs, which are identity service providers. Just so that you do know, we do have a Q&A feature. And that is at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're kind of new to Zoom, I guess we all have been using Zoom throughout the pandemic. So I'm sure you know where it is. And um, also this webinar is CPD accredited. So within four weeks time, you should receive a certificate as well. Great. So let us kick off. So we're first going to be going over the new code of practice, and this is kicking in from the 6th of April 2022. So we only have a few weeks left to get compliant and get ready. So um, David is going to go through um, talking about resident cards and permits, liability that you would have as an agent, and also some share code. So I'll hand over to David. Thanks. So if we jump to our first slide, um, basically all of the current changes spring from 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 COVID and the adjustments that carried, were carried out during COVID. Um, we um, had, um, as as you all recall, during COVID, the government basically decided to to make things safer by allowing people to do checks online. So it initially started out as a temporary thing, then you would have to run, then redo the checks later, and then they shifted it and said, no, you don't. So we moved from a position where basically checks had to be done with actual documents in hand, face-to-face. And during COVID, that was altered um, to um, a situation where every single document could be sent electronically, and then the, um, this was done, then the checks were done using video. And um, the, the summary is that people liked that. I mean, in, in short, it, it, it transpired, which is not really a terrible surprise, I have to say. And, and, and there's a sort of a, why didn't they do this earlier if this was okay, apparently? Um, um, it, it, um, uh, it, it, it was the case that, that people obviously found this useful and easier. And the government then started to think about how it could do more video and, and more, more sort of online stuff. And of course, then they were also putting into place online checking anyway, and has started putting into place online checking for EU settled status. Um, And so a lot of the current changes now are looking at how to expand the online checking process for EU settled status to everybody so that everyone can do it all online and people don't have to produce passports and driving licenses and birth certificates 
and the whole panoply of documents that agents are forced to get their heads around and try and decide whether they're real or fake. Um, so if we jump on a little bit. So all of this is based around the amusingly named IDSPs or identity service providers. So <clears throat> what we've, we've done is that, um, is that the government has, has, um, has, has already, of course, got in place a, a digital system for um, EU settled status people. So people who had EU settled status were using an online checking service provided by the Home Office. The pressure then was to increase that so that people who were UK nationals and had British passports or indeed Irish passports, so now post-Brexit, um, anyone who has a British or Irish passport has a full right to rent. Anyone from the EU will either have to have EU settled status or show you that they have um, pre-settled status through one of the checking services. Um, so people with EU settled status and lots of different visas increasingly can use the Home Office's online checking service. But that rather left the, the, the um, ordinary sort of people, British, British nationals and Irish nationals out of the cold, as it were, having to produce passports and go through a more traditional checking method. So the government's fix for this is IDSPs. Now, they've had to be a bit cautious about this because, of course, <laughs> if, they, if they put all British people onto a database like they're doing with all foreign nationals, that would be identity cards. And um, uh, the right wing of the Conservative Party just ain't going to have identity cards. And of course, the current government voted against identity cards uh, quite aggressively uh, when, when the uh, Brown government, uh, some time ago now, um, thought about introducing them. So, so uh, the government's had to sort of come up with a, a mechanism to do this online that doesn't look like it's an identity card system. So... What, what, what they've got with it well, are, are these, these wonderfully named identity service providers or IDSPs. And just to get all the acronyms out in the open immediately, IDSPs use IDVT, which is Identity Validation Technology. So you're going to be hearing a lot about IDVT and IDSPs. But in summary, the IDVT is the technology that underlines what IDSPs do. Um, and essentially, um, IDVT is an agreed protocol between the Home Office, and you can read the protocol if you really, really want to, but I advise you not to. Um, it's an agreed protocol between the Home Office and various um, third-party providers of checks, and those third-party check providers will get tenants to register with them, and they will then use the IDVT technology to validate their identity by scanning documents and so on and taking information. And they will then certify that back um, to the individual landlord or agent on, a, on an as request basis. Now, there are several problems with this structure that make it a bit weird. <clears throat> First, of course, there are more, there's more than one provider in the market, unsurprisingly. Um, so in practice, that means that tenants are actually going to end up having to register with multiple providers if they want to get, uh, and will over time inevitably register with multiple providers as they go through different agents and landlords, depending on which provider each agent or landlord is using. So there's going to be some pressure on tenants to either register across multiple providers, which they might not like very much, um, or on agents and landlords to use multiple providers themselves to, 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 to sort of detect the widest pool of tenants, as it were, and, and validate them. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it. There's also the point, of course, that it requires people to register uh, to use the technology. They don't have to, and individual, individual Irish and British nationals are perfectly entitled to decline to authorise through an IDSP uh, and ask to be uh, right to rent checked in the traditional manner, looking at their passport. And uh, the government has updated its guidance on discrimination um, to make clear that that is perfectly acceptable and it is unlawful discrimination for you to insist on a tech-based solution. But of course, that is definitely a problem and it is almost inevitable, I think, that, um, that agents are going to prefer tenants who can be tech-authorised, particularly as some of this technology is likely to integrate completely into their computer systems and therefore be very rapid and seamless for many agents. Um, it's almost inevitable that people who can do a rapid and seamless IDSP check as against someone who's going to take a couple of days to produce a passport 
are likely to get preferential access to property in a fast moving market. And, and, and that's not that's not necessarily discrimination if the reason for the, for the decision is speed as opposed to refusing a paper based check. But it obviously it leaves certain groups of people who don't have access to uh, at all the same level of access to the internet much more out in the cold and that's not particularly productive in my view um and and then uh, the third point of course is that some tenants are likely to get somewhat annoyed about this there's already been quite a lot of pushback with the use of open banking for referencing um there's a lot of pressure on um uh, on about about uh, data theft and data protection and so a number of people are like to be somewhat squirrely about placing their data into uh, IDSPs. So I think that's a, a question that's got to be answered. And of course, it will be up to the government and the IDSPs to be able to satisfy people that their uh, that their systems are robust and secure. Um, and then the final point, which is, I think, kind of a bit of a bit of a joke, really, is the liability issue. Um, actually, it's up to landlords to satisfy themselves that the IDSP they elect to use um, is actually carrying out checks in a manner approved by the Home Office. And realistically, that's impossible. There is no manner in which a landlord or an agent is able to realistically go behind the tech being used by the IDSP they have signed up to and verify to their satisfaction, or indeed any satisfaction, that the system is actually operating uh, in the manner that, that, they, that, that they say it is. And there have been, you know, vast numbers of historic problems with this kind of stuff. For example, for a lo- for the longest time, Amazon's passwords were actually transmitted in the clear. There have been, been na- international systems where actually the passwords were never checked and it was always assumed when you type the password and you got it right. So there have been lots of examples of technology providers o- over the years not providing very high quality te- che- tech. And there's always the possibility that an IDSP will simply be saying yes to everybody and not doing the checks at all. And landlords simply have no way of knowing. Now, I hasten to add, I'm not suggesting that any IDSP would do that, but it's certainly a possibility. And landlords simply don't know. So they're going to have to end up relying to some extent. And I assume most IDSPs will provide some pretty strong warranties and, 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 and sort of confirmation. But the reality is that the obligation is not on the IDSP, it's on the user of the service to verify that the service is is robust. And that seems like a bit of an odd circuit that that doesn't seem entirely satisfactory to me. Um, I mean, I I contrast this, of course, with landlords and letting agents. If a landlord signs over their responsibility to a letting agent, as they can do under legislation, the letting agent is liable for that. But if a landlord signs over responsibility to an IDSP, the IDSP apparently, in law at least, has no liability at all. That doesn't seem like an equitable balance to me. Moving on. Thank you, David. I feel like we have some questions. I'm Um, sure we do. Questions. So um, I'll kick off with Jessica's question. Thank you for sending one in. So um, Jessica said that she thought that the companies had to be verified. So that is that their backup by using a verified slash checked company providing us the service? I believe she's um, referring to IDSPs. Yeah, so IDSPs do have to to sign up with them um, with the. Uh, the Home Office, and they have to verify with the government they're using the the technology appropriately. But the Home Office's code of practice is crystal clear that the liability still falls with the landlord, and it's up to the landlord to make their own checks. So um, it appears that the Home Office is saying, well, we'll sign these people up, but we're not, the Home Office isn't guaranteeing it. The companies presumably are guaranteeing it to you, but you have no absolute certainty of it, no. Right. Thank you. Um, we've got a similar question here. Um, can tenants apply for an IDVT check without a passport? I th- I'm going to throw that one to you, Jenny. <laughs> You're the one who knows more about how IDSPs work than I do, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of them applying for the check without a passport, um, it, they will need an ID document that they would need to do that with. And I believe that the government is still actually developing um, their kind of guidelines as to what is going to be required of an IDVT check. So um, as the legislation develops, we will know a bit more. But I do believe that they will need an ID document and that being a passport. 
Yeah, so, um, so the reality is, of course, with this, this checking system is that I, IDSPs, at least initially, will only be checking, as it were, the, the easiest pickoffs from, from, from an agent perspective, which are people with passports, if people have got more complex ID requirements, then an IDSP is not likely to be able to verify them for you. Thank you. Um, we do have a question here from Robin, and um, Robin is asking, how is right to rent affected by landlords considering um, refugees from Ukraine? Good question. Um, it's it's not really. Um, if you're accepting a refugee from Ukraine, they still have to pass right to rent checks. Uh, if they're coming through the new, um, uh, the government's new Homes for Ukraine scheme, then they will be granted a temporary right to reside and presumably a right to rent as part of their entry into the UK on the sponsorship visa that's going to be created. Um, so they should be able to show that to you. But the government has yet to be entirely clear what that sponsorship visa will look like, whether it will be provided electronically or on paper or what you're going to do with it. So uh, until we know that, and we're not supposed to know until at least tomorrow when the guidance is supposed to be published, although I'm not betting on it arriving tomorrow, um, I, it's not a question I could fully answer right now, I'm afraid. Thank you, David. And just one last question, and then we'll um, go through the other questions at the end in the live Q&A. Um, Vera is asking um, that if a EU national has British citizenship and a British passport, as well as EU nationality, and has been living in the UK for over 20 years, do they need to apply for an EU settled status? No, because they have British citizenship and therefore they have a, a right to reside here. EU settled states, people who don't have a right to reside here uh, to obtain it. Perfect. And one last question. Um, we have an agent who is asking, can we just carry on doing the same normal checks? Um, for example, um, do the check in person with the documents? Um, it depends who you're checking. So, so one of the things that uh, I should have started out with really is that is that the new code of practice, which comes into April, changes some of the checks. So if you're checking EU and Irish nationals, then traditional document checks, which are now largely uh, start with passports and then go on from there, are, are still perfectly possible. And you are required to be able to provide manual checking as an alternative to IDSPs anyway. Um, if you're checking people from abroad, then the government has slashed back on your, what you're allowed to check as a document. So all forms of biometric residence card and biometric residence permit and frontier workers permit, um, you are not allowed to check uh, those physical documents anymore. You must use the Home Office's online portal. So anyone who's presenting to you with, with uh, claiming they have EU settled status, or an electronic visa, um, or any form of BRP, BRC, Frontier Workers Permit, all of that stuff uh, must now be checked through the Home Office's online portal. Um, and those people should present you with a share code, um, and you get that and their date of birth. You type that into the Home Office's portal, and it's linked from the Code of Practice, um, and they will then pull up a screen, you'll get their photograph on that screen, you need to compare it with that person um, and, um, and, 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 and make sure it's the same person. And then the screen will also tell you whether they have a right to rent or not. It will be in pretty red light, red writing. Um, in principle, they can also send you an automated email out of this service, um, which um, allows you to, to jump to the check. Um, I'm a bit worried about that because um, I'm sure most of you have seen scam emails. It seems almost inevitable to me that uh, at some stage, scam emails linking to fake websites that look like the Home Office's share code website but aren't um, are going to appear. So I would strongly advise you to go on, to go on the method of, of going to the Home Office website from the code of practice you've got off the government website using a share code in the date of birth rather than clicking on links in any email sent to you. I would always be innately suspicious of a link in an email. Um, they're, they're pretty, I mean, links in email are known to be high risk anyway um, for viruses and so on. I think they're pretty high risk for right to rent. So focus on the code. 
Um, the other situation where, where checks now are, are have to be done uh, online is, is there's a slightly different service just to make it so we're actually talking about three different online services now. So the, we've talked about IDSPs. I've talked about the, uh, the online service for, called, uh, called the Viewing Attendance Right to Rent. There is the third service, which is the, home, the, the old home office landlord checking service, which is now also online. That's the third service. Um, so that's people with um, who have made an application for EU settled status but haven't got it yet, um, uh, uh, um, where there are asylum seekers, um, where they have an ongoing immigration application or appeal, um, or they have their documents with the Home Office, or where they've been granted permission to rent by the Home Office. For the person who was asking about Ukraine earlier, I suspect Ukraine people initially are going to fall into the category of granted permission to rent by the Home Office. All of those people, um, you're then required to use a totally different online service where you put in their name and, and, and uh, date of birth. And um, then you get a yes response from the Home Office checking service with a period of time for which they have a right to rent. And then you have that period plus 28 days, which, is, which allows you to make a further check back with the landlord, uh, the Home Office Landlord's Checking Service uh, after that period runs out. The other point about this is it's the exception to the normal rule, which is that everyone gets right to rent for at least 12 months or the period on their documents, if longer. Um, if you go through the LCS, the person has the right to rent for the period specified in the LCS check. And in some cases, that's just three months um, where they've got, particularly where they've got an application pending before the Home Office. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's now, there's, we've now gone to a position where we have, we've gone from having no online services to a positive plethora of online services, all of which are subtly different and which you need to get your heads around. Again, the code of practice has the links to these services. Um, obviously not to IDSPs who are independent third parties, but the code perhaps is linked to the other two services and you need to know those. Um, so increasingly physical documents are not an acceptable means of checking unless you're looking at people's UK or Irish passports, UK documents to verify UK nationality, or someone who's entered the country with a passport and a visa and then the third example would be someone who's come from an EU country um, or a B5J SSK country um, inside the last six months because and, and has come through an electronic passport gate at Heathrow or, or the like. Those people automatically have a right to rent for six months and they will show you their passport um, and their, their um, boarding card to show that they come into the country. So it's quite a complicated situation sort of starting to arise. So just last thing to talk about, liability apportionment between landlord and agent. As I've already indicated, it's still possible for landlords and agents to apportion liability between themselves. Landlords can pass their liability to their agent and, and have, and have continued, to, continued to be able to do so by way of a written agreement between them. Um, obviously, there is a difference, and it's important if you're an agent, your terms of business distinguish between initial checks and then further right to rent checks for people who only have a time limited right to rent um, because they are different things in law. So you may say to landlords, well, we're not doing any right to rent checks. You have to do them. Or you may say to landlords, well, we'll do the initial right to rent check, but any follow on checks are your responsibility. Or you may say to landlords, we'll do both. Um, I tend to find that most agents who are doing let only um, will do the initial check, but not the follow ons. And then people who are doing fully managed will do both. But you do need to be clear about what the service you're offering is. Contrastingly, as I've already said, IDSPs do not have a statutory liability, although, of course, they might have civil liability if they promise to do things. And then the last thing I should mention as well is discrimination. So the code of practice um, is changing from April the 6th. You can get the updated version and what I'm talking about today, of course, is based on the new draft version, which is on the government's website. Um, there is also a new draft code of practice on avoiding unlawful discrimination, again, on the government's website. A lot of it has not changed much. Where it has changed is to take into account IDSPs specifically 
And as I've already indicated, that what well, its its main its main sort of point is that uh, you need to make sure um, that you're offering people both options. Just because someone doesn't want to use an IDSP or can't use an IDSP, that is not a justification for refusing them a um, a, t- a tenancy or offering them worse terms. Phew. Right. Some more questions, I think, will are likely to ar- arise. Yes. So I've got a question here from um, Mabub and she says, do we have to use IDSP for all British citizens as a right to rent check process? No, absolutely not. In fact, you cannot do that. You must you must allow British nationals to offer you documents or IDSP. It's your choice. You could simply say we don't do IDSP. That's fine. And do all checks manually. What you're not allowed to do is say we only use IDSP. Thank you, David. Um, We've got a question here from Chloe. So Chloe is asking if the tenancy starts in April, but the checks are done prior to the change in legislation, is this acceptable? Um, This this is right. This is a really good question, actually, because this actually addresses a sort of elephant in the room here. So the government's actually altered the checking windows a little bit. If you're checking someone for a permanent right to rent, so a British or Irish national, or someone who's got a permanent right to reside, you can check them at any point prior to the tenancy. There's no time limit. Now, this does open up an interesting point, because previously we've tended towards the view that that you had to redo a check. If so, say if if a, a tenant was moving to a different property with the same landlord, they in theory needed to be checked again. And that's what the legislation says. But it also, but if, if you're able to do a check at any point prior to the tenancy, even potentially years ago, um, you could, in theory, just do one check. And provided the tenant stays with the same landlord that moves around their properties, for example, or even arguably stays with the same agent, um, that check should be good for all future tenancies. So there's a sort of weird sort of scenario up there. The other situation is, is where someone is, is being checked for a time-limited right to rent that check must be done in the 28 days before the tenancy is entered into. So the answer to the question is, it depends on the type of person you're proposing to do the tenancy with and whether they can establish a permanent right, in which case your check is good ad infinitum, or whether they're establishing a time-limited right, in which case the dates will matter. Great. Thank you, David. We've got a question here from Jessica, Um, a little bit of a statement, but also a question. (laughs) Is this new format being delayed from April to October as the government are not ready? Um, She's heard about this. And if so, do we keep with the current way of verifying documents in person or via video? So, David, I believe you did go over this a little bit um, earlier. But if you can clarify what the current situation is, that would be great. Yeah. So so basically, in-person document checks have been allowed throughout. During COVID, the government then said, well, actually, we don't mind if you don't do them in person. You can do them on video with the documents sent to you electronically. Um, And they kept extending that. And they have, yes, as as has been suggested, extended that out to September now. That was indeed supposed to stop in April. And IDSPs were supposed to come up as as the alternative to this in April. IDSPs are not going to be active in April. This is not a huge surprise to most of us who have anything to do with all of this, because it was always an unrealistic deadline. Um, and the new start date for IDSPs is now September. So currently you can do a manual check or you can continue the COVID-based protocol of, of doing your checks uh, online with an electronic document up to September. Um, far be it for me to suggest, but I would be somewhat surprised if there's any IDSPs operating by September. And I, I, I somewhat suspect that the current online protocol will, will, that everyone was, has been using the last few months will roll quietly on into 2023. But um, obviously, I might be wrong, and there might be IDSPs coming out of every every orifice by September, and we'll all be fine. But I don't, I don't think it's realistic. Uh, the, the government still hasn't approved that many IDSPs. Um, they then got to sign contracts with various agents, convince them that they're they're any good. Agents have then got to have got to get the software integrated and uh, and 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 train their staff. And I just don't see that realistically happening before September. But I'm happy to be wrong. I, I, I'll ask Jolene. Jolene, do you, do you think it'll be ready for September? How are you guys getting on? 
I want to have faith in the government. So hopefully it will be ready in September. They've already extended it once. So hopefully they don't extend it twice. Um, but that does give um, IDSPs and companies like us some time to develop um, some technology that will enable um, for our agents to have a really smooth right to rent checking um, process. So hopefully there they don't are. extend it again. But I, I'm um, more cynical than you are. <laughs> of course. Um, so moving on to another question. So Andrea is asking, do you know if there are any plans to combine all of these new digital services into one in the future? So I'll probably give my take on this, David. I think sure. we are moving towards a really digitized right to rent process. We saw the start of this with share codes. We have had the landlord checking service for quite some time now, but I don't think it will be a surprise that in the future, they completely digitise right to rent as a whole and you do try to stop checking some of the documents in person. I'm not too sure if there's a plan to combine it all into one. Um, the government haven't come out with anything like that at this current point, but I do believe that in the near future we should see um, really all of these processes being digitised. Um, David, what do you think? I think it'd be very difficult for the current government politically to run an ID checking system for UK nationals. They can job it out to third parties. It would be quite difficult for them to run it on a central basis. Um, and and I, I suspect what they'll actually do is see how IDSPs get on. Um, they'll also probably see if IDSP technology and IDBT stuff spreads in, in terms of other areas. So if other, other parts of the, of, the, of the system pick it up, but it's quite difficult for the current government to legislate for anything that looks like an ID card. An IDSP's smell of ID card to a lot of people. Perfect. Thank you, David. Um, we do have a question here about um, UK citizens who have a permanent right to rent anyway. Um, when do you think is the right time for them to be doing the right to rent check? Should it be prior to signing a tenancy agreement or when they come to pick up the keys and their prescribed documents? Well, you're, you're obliged to do it prior to them signing a tenancy agreement. So that would be the best time. Um, but people with permanent right to rent, you can do it any time before they sign the agreement. So I would do it as early as possible and have done with it. Yeah, definitely agree with David, um, especially if you do have a pre-qualification process. It's really great to see what type of, type of right to rent that tenant has um, you are legally obliged to do that before the applicant signs any sort of legal documentation so definitely before they sign the tenancy agreement thank you um, we do have a um, another question here um, so we have quite a lot of questions about if agents will still be able to accept a photocopy of identification such as passports and so forth what do you advise on that well, you're not allowed to accept a photocopy. You're allowed to set, accept an electronic scan under the current regime, and you will continue to be able to do so up until IDSP technology becomes long. Thank you, David. Um, I've got a really good question here from Rebecca. So Rebecca has asked, what is the difference between IDVT and requesting share codes? Do they work alongside each other? Uh, no, they're for totally different parties, really. So share codes are... are the government's website run by the Home Office or by contractors on their behalf um, for people who have got EU settled status or some form of electronic visa. And the government will undoubtedly expand that to cover its whole sweep of visa provision. Um, IDVT and IDSPs are, are third party private companies who have entered into a contract with the Home Office to check UK and Irish nationals only. So they're not dealing with the same people and they are they are different organisations. Great. Thank you, David. Um, we do have a question here from Mohammed. So Mohammed um, states, can I take someone as a tenant who has applied for a visa extension but still hasn't got a home office decision? Uh, well, yes, but you need to you need to phone the landlord checking service. That's what it's for. Um, definitely do agree with um, David there, Mohammed. Um, you can use the landlord checking service, it's online, and that will tell you if you can rent to an applicant and whilst they're still awaiting a decision from the Home Office. Great, so um, we've got a question here from Caroline. Um, she says, if they insist on giving an email, then could we check them through the landlord checking 
service? No. If someone, I mean, if someone wants to give you an email, it'll have the share code in it. You don't have to click on the link on the email. You can simply take the share code out of the email and go back to the website and type it in. Great. Thank you, David. Um, we do have quite a few questions here about when the changes are coming in place. So um, just a quick reminder, the changes are coming in place from the 6th of April. So you do need to be ready by the 6th of April. And we also do have questions about if um, agents need to recheck existing tenants. No, absolutely not. This is not a, this is not a, this is only a, a this is only really slight tweaks to, to an existing system. It's not a replacement for the existing system. If people have established a right to rent with you already, then that stays established. Um, if they had a time limited right to rent, then obviously any recheck would need to be done in, 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 in line with the new code of practice. It's, it's important to be clear, we're not changing the law here. The law is not changed. Um, but the code of practice is statutorily approved by Parliament, and it sort of tells you how you have to implement the law on the ground. That is changing a little bit, but not a lot in many ways, only around, only around the, the detail in a sense. The underlying statutory mechanism has not changed. Um, I mean, in fact, it, it really changed uh, uh, some months ago, of course, with the whole thing about British and Irish nationals and EU settled status as we left the EU, um, which was pretty much a year ago now. So, so um, the, the only change here is, is, is quite a subtle change to the code of practice. It doesn't affect the rights of anybody who's already obtained a right to run. Thank you, David. And would you say that the Home Office online check um, is replacing visas and permits and passports that is another question that we do have here yeah so so basically people who are in the uh, in the home office online services anyone with eu settled status people with an e-visa and people who have uh, a brp a, a biometric residence permit a brc a biometric residence card which are basically two versions of the same thing just from different eras and a frontier workers permit which is an old style permit, which is now being phased out and replaced with the, it's basically the, the new fruit picking permit, essentially, <clears throat> which, um, which is, is, is replacing that, that scheme. Those are all moving online only. You can't look at those cards anymore. They're not valid. Um, over time, the Home Office is clearly indicating a trajectory to shift more of its visa activity online. But there will still be people who have, and will be for quite some time, um, who will have historic stamped visas in their passports and those people were, and, and th that will continue to happen in certain types of visa and those visas will need to be checked physically so not every visa will move online yet although that seems to be a, a, a direction of travel great thank you david um we do have a question here from anya and this is surrounding um the duration of an applicant's right to rent. So let's say an applicant has permission to rent for three months. Um, can they issue a six month tenancy? Would they need to decline the application? No, you, you, you can't do that. That's unlawful discrimination. You, you cannot give somebody different terms based on the quality of their right to rent. Once they've established a right to rent, they've either got it or they haven't. If they've got it, then you must offer them exactly the same terms as anybody else. You are not permitted to offer somebody a shorter tenancy um, on the basis that they only have a three month right to rent. And in, in essence, you have to assume that everyone with a short right to rent is gonna get it renewed. That's the, the summary. And, and to be fair, the Home Office doesn't normally offer right to rent to people who they're really, really doubtful about. Great. Thank you. And that does answer some questions here. So in terms of when we come up to tenancy renewal and they do have foreign tenants, would you advise that they do another right to rent check? Not necessarily. There's, there's, the two things are entirely decoupled. I mean, I, I think it would probably depend a little bit on, on what the original time limited right to rent was. If I was coming up to renewal and someone's time limited right to rent was going to run out next month, then it would be practical to do their right to rent check before their renewal. Um, but if their right to rent has got another six or eight months to run, then I would just do the renewal and do the right to rent check at the appropriate time. So 
the, the difficulty with that is it kind of assumes that everyone's time limited right to rent is the same and they're not. Um, obviously, permanent right to rent, no, of course you don't need to redo a check. Why would you? Um, if it's a time limited right to rent, then you'll probably need to take a view depending on what the time limit was that originally occurred. Thank you, David. We do have some questions here on Hong Kong nationals who tend to have a British national overseas passport. It would be really good to get some clarity on this. So um, as for those who have a BNO visa scheme, what would you say is the best way to carry out their right to rent check? Um, well, they're still, they should still be presenting a BNO um, physical, uh, a physical passport. A British nationals overseas passport is not a right to reside in the UK. They do not automatically have a right to rent. They will need to present you with a visa as well. The visa should indicate um, whether it's a permanent right to reside here, in which case they will have a permanent right to rent, or whether it's time limited, in which case they will have a time limited right to rent. Then you need to act accordingly. So it, it so it depends on the on on the nature of the visa, but in practice, you need to look at the passport. You need to look at the visa. You need to satisfy yourself that it's a valid document and it's the same person, um, and then um, follow the terms of the visa. If you're uncertain, then I would get use the landlord checking service. And would you say that they would be issued with a share code also potentially? Uh, no, they won't normally be issued with a share code because they're not electronic visas at the current time. David. Um, we do have a question from Alex here and it's just to provide some clarity on liability. So um, can you confirm that in terms of liability it's up to landlords to make sure that the IDPS, I'm sorry, the IDSPs are compliant and doing the checks properly? Yeah, the way the Home Office has written the current code of practice is, is unfortunately they've They've um, they've said that um, that it's up to the, the landlord to confirm the IDSP is doing its job, but I don't see a really practical way of you doing that. So you're probably just going to have to take it on faith, I guess. I, I, I assume IDSPs are going to do a reasonable amount to try and reassure people. Great. Thank you. Um, we do have a question here from Exana, and she would like you to name the three online services once again, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so we have IDSPs, um, which are which are obviously will all have their own names in the end. They are all private individuals checking uh, basically uh, UK and Irish nationals. We have the Home Office Online Right to Rent Check. It doesn't have a, a formal name, but it's it's called Viewer Tenants Right to Rent in England. It is it is for people um, with EU settled status and e visas primarily. And then we have the Home Office Landlord Checking Service, which is the original service. And that's for people who are saying that they've got an EU settled status application in um, or an asylum seeker or an ongoing immigration application or appeal with the Home Office. So those are the three electronically based systems. Thank you, David. We do have a question here from Lou. So I believe David and I have kind of reiterated the importance of a right to rent check and definitely doing it before um, you get an applicant to sign um, the tenancy agreement. Lou would like to know what are the penalties for not doing an ongoing right to rent check? Um, well, you could be fined. Um, basically, the, the fine is, is higher if it's a second or, or multiple offence inside the first three years. Um, uh, and ultimately, although this has never actually happened, if the if the government is of the view that you've been seriously negligent or completely ignored your obligations, you can be prosecuted. And uh, the jail sentence, I think, is up to five years off the top of my head. It's quite bad. <laughs> so don't, don't do it. Great. Thank you. You're, you're better off to employ people unlawfully. It's a much lower fine. No. Thank you. We do have quite a lot of questions here um, about Good Lord and our stance on IDSPs. Um, so at the moment, we are currently in very early stages of um, looking into um, IDSPs and also trying to become IDBT accredited. Um, so that is where we are currently at the moment. Um, so we do have more information about our stance and what we will have for our offering for our customers. We'll definitely let you all know as well. Thank you. We do have some questions here on Commonwealth and um, the USA. Um, David, in from your perspective, 
how does this um, new code of practice affect um, American citizens and um, citizens from Commonwealth countries such as Canada? Uh, doesn't really alter it. Um, I mean, the, the main the Canada and the USA, of course, were already picked up by the new B5J SSK rules. So people from the big five, um, which is the UK, but you can discount that. So USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, anyone from, from the B5J SSK countries who enters the UK using a, a biometric passport um, automatically has a six month right to rent. And if they show you their um, boarding pass, uh, whether it's electronically or physical or some other ticket or something that showed they've come into the country inside the last six months, then they immediately get a right to rent. And you will not need to then check them for 12 months after that date. So it doesn't affect them because that rule has been in place now for, for the best part of the year. Great. Thank you. Um, so we do have some more questions um, here on the just the some clarification on the timeline. So, um, David, could you just give us a clear kind of brief on the timelines of the new code of practice and what our agents should be doing now in comparison to what they should be doing in September? Yeah. So the new code of practice comes into effect on the sixth of April. Um, once that comes into effect, you will not be able to take uh, uh, biometric residence permits, biometric residence cards, frontier workers permits. Physically, you will have to do those checks online. Um, the new code of practice already embraces IDSPs, but independently of that, the Home Office has made clear that IDSPs will not be in place until September, at least in my view, but it depends on, on we'll have to see. And until that period, the special COVID exemption will continue to operate and agents can continue to do checks um, by video with online provided documents, as an, or, or they can just do them physically. So for, for people um, presenting with a permanent right to rent, not a lot has changed. For people presenting with EU settled status, not a lot is changing. Um, for people presenting with more unusual things like biometric residence cards and biometric residence permits, there is a big change in April. Um, and then in September, in theory, there will be a big change then again for people um, who are presenting as UK or Irish nationals who are presenting essentially for a permanent right to rent. Great. Thank you for your clarification on that, um, David. We do have a question here from Vanessa, and I am happy to take this. So Vanessa is asking, um, she just had a little look online, and there are a couple of providers um, for IDSPs already, but they're not government registered providers. Um, are they ready yet? So the government has given a deadline to September um, for IDSPs to become IDVT accredited. So um, they, I don't think any sort of provider, as David mentioned previously, would be ready at this stage. So um, I believe in the upcoming months, probably summer, um, we would see um, some IDSPs come forward with that accreditation. But um, we're not aware of any that are ready at this current um, moment. Um, IDSPs are, are also not just operating for this purpose. They're also being put forward, for example, for home purchasing. So if you want to buy a house, um, instead of uh, of your conveyance or having to do ID checks via um, you know the trad method of making you turn up at their office with a passport and all the rest of it, they'll be able to use IDSPs for that. So there are some advertising for other sectors as well. Um, I mean, in, in theory, there's no reason why they couldn't work across multiple sectors, but um, there are certainly some advertising into the legal sector at the moment. But they're not they're not mostly fully ready to play. Perfect. Thank you, David. Um, we've got a question from Sarah, and she has stated that if you placed a non-UK resident in a property over six years ago by looking at their passport, do you need um, to do a right to rent check now if they are on a periodic tenancy? Um, if you put someone into a not into a property before right to rent came into effect and have never renewed their tenancy, then no, you don't have to do anything. Great. Perfect. No worries. Um, moving on to Tristan. Um, Tristan has asked, how can he conduct a check on a tenant outside the EU if they have not yet received their BRP and do not have a share code? 
uh, well, I mean, one, a BRP is going to be irrelevant anyway. Um, they should, uh, in the, the short answer is you can't until, uh, until the share code is available. You won't be able to check. Perfect. We have another question here. And um, this person is asking, if you carry out a right to rent check, online via the share code system do you have to have a video call to verify the passport no because you're not using the passport you have to have a video call to verify the picture that you look at when you look at the share code so it's a two someone's got to give you a share code you've got to log into the website you then need to get that person on video or in front of you and compare their face smiling away at you on your video call with the other version of their face, not smiling quite so much on the Home Office website. Great, thank you. Hopefully we can differentiate between a tenant who's smiling and a tenant who isn't quite smiling. Oh, well, we hope so, yes. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, moving on to Helen's question. So Helen is asking, how long after a tenancy has ended um, can we hold on to certified ID docs on file? So this does seem a bit more like a GDPR question. Well, uh, the right to rent requires you to retain them for one year after um, after after the tenancy has ended and the person's vacated. If you want to retain them for longer than that, then you would obviously need some form of justification. Top tip, you probably won't have one. So, so, so I wouldn't be holding on to them beyond the, the right to rent period. Great. Um, we just have another question here. And um, this agent is stating, is it right to say that we cannot accept British passports in person anymore? They will have to be verified online. No, it's 100% the other way around. You must continue to accept British passports in person. You may also offer online verification. Great. Thank you. Um, really good question um, from Jen here. And we possibly do have agents on our call at the moment who are also possibly thinking the same thing. Can the status of a right to rent change? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, I mean, normally from time limited to permanent as opposed to the other way around, I suppose. I mean, the government can take away people's citizenship in theory, but it's a bit of a contested issue right now. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Someone could have a time limited right to rent and then obtain a permanent right to rent. So you might be on the EU settled status scheme, for example, which is time limited, or, or on the pre-settled status scheme, which is time limited, and marry a UK national and obtain permanent UK citizenship, or simply apply for and obtain permanent UK citizenship. I know people who have done that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, people's status can change for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here from um, Rebecca. Um, and she stated that um, she thought that we stated that IDSPs would not be in place even by September. So what is the 6th of, of April? So the 6th of April is when the new code of practice comes into force. Um, and and that will that that preps the ground for IDSPs and also changes the rules about BRPs and BRCs. It is possible that IDSPs will be in place for September and this new code of practice will seamlessly skip across at that point and cover IDSPs as a checking mechanism. So the 6th of April is, is basically the new code of practice and I said a subtle change for BRPs and BRCs. Great, thank you, David. Right, so um, we've got a question from Laura. So Laura states, are there going to be any IDSP organisations that you are going to recommend or will they all have the same level of credibility? So I think this is more a question geared at Good Lord. So um, as I stated earlier before, we are currently like in early stages, discovery stages of looking at IDSPs that will become kind of IDBT um, accredited by the um, government. Um, if they are accredited, IDBT accredited, they should all have that kind of same level of credibility. But as David said, with third party um, providers, they all probably have their own unique um, selling points as well. But once we do have more information on it um, here at Good Lord, we will definitely let our customer base know. And if you aren't a customer um, here at Good Lord and you would like to kind of know more about it and what our offering is, especially when it comes to right to rent, please do contact us and we'll be able to have a chat about that. 
Thank you. Right, so um, I'm just going to go through a few more questions. We have about six minutes. Um, we do have a question here. Um, David, can you confirm that if we are we going to be using IDSPs for Europeans and the rest of the world? So mm -hmm. I believe, um, want some clarification here, does the IDSPs apply to British citizens also? No, IDSP is only for British and Irish nationals. It will not be dealing with the EU and rest of the world. That will be run through the, the home office systems for the foreseeable future. Great, thank you. Um, we do have some more questions here. Um, Rebecca is asking, um, what should an agent do if the tenant's right to rent is expiring or has expired and they can't get a share code? Uh, then you need to report them. Um, there's a there's a reporting online reporting tool again accessible via um, uh, the code of practice. There's a link to it, and you need to report them for for being in breach of the right to rent. You can at that point ask the Home Office to provide you um, with a certificate verifying they don't have a right to rent to allow for eviction as well. Great, perfect. Thank you. Um, we do have quite a few agents on the call today that do have quite a few overseas students. Um, so here is a question. What happens with overseas students for this upcoming academic year? If we have carried out checks in person last month, would they need to have a share code check as well? It depends when you sign the tenancy agreement. Um, if, if they've only got time limited right to rent checks, you can only do the checks in the 28 days before the tenancy agreement was signed. So if you sign the tenancy agreement immediately uh, after having done the check last month, then no, you don't need to do anything else. If you didn't sign the tenancy agreement, you shouldn't have done the check last month. You're going to have to do it again. Great. Thank you. And uh, I'm just going to go over three last questions. And if I haven't answered your question today, um, we will look through them and see what we could do and get back to you. Um, we do have a question here, um, quite a few actually on this um, that have come in throughout the few minutes what is the change with the brp card are they being phased out and will be giving a share code instead the change of the brp card is you cannot do a right to rent check using a physical brp card you will need to get a share code i mean i mean the, the summary answer is yes they are being phased out anyway and, and the government's been trying to make it like eu settled status mm -hmm. And um, David, could you just clarify on when this will be from? From the 6th of April, you cannot accept a BRP or BRC or FWP for, as a physical document. It must be done electronically. Great, perfect. And um, just our last question. If the tenant has a limited right to rent, um, but it doesn't run out until 2024. Do we need to do another check within those 28 days before entering the tenancy? Yes. Because time limited right to rent must be checked within 28 days before tenancy begins, always. Great, so that is all the time we have for um, questions. Thank you so much to everyone who has submitted a question. I do apologize if I haven't um, answered your questions with David, but we'll definitely go through them and see if we can provide some sort of FAQ stock afterwards. Um, I do would love to recommend for you all to download our um, free ebook. Um, you will receive a link to this um, with a copy of the webinar afterwards. And this is your guide to lettings and the law. So um, please do go over this ebook. It will really aid you in staying compliant. And this is to discover the latest insights around the evolving legislation in lettings. Um, and there is also an audio book that comes along with that as well. Great. So thank you for your time. We do really do appreciate you all um, attending today and you should receive a copy of the webinar, sorry, a recording of the webinar in your emails um, shortly. And also you would receive a CPD accredited certificate within four weeks time. Mm -hmm.